Frankly, friends, it's, I'm honored for you folks to be here tonight. There's just two ground rules that I'm going to put to you, and I don't think this is going to be any problem with this crowd. But first of all, if you have any doubts about climate change, you can leave right now. Secondly, if you don't like to hear the hard facts of what we as a civilization are facing in the near future, then perhaps you might want to consider uh, leaving at this time, because what I'm about to say is something that I've been studying since I've retired 14 years ago. And the more I read, the more concerned I get. So what I'm doing is strictly pro bono. It's because I want to. Why do I want to? Well, for example, within a few more days, I'm going to be a great-grandfather the second time around. And I look at my children, my children's children, and all of the children of the faces that I see out here, and I think of what's down the road, and I say, by golly, we have got to do something. Now, one man can't do much, but I'm going to try to at least convince you tonight that there is reasons enough for anyone that's concerned to start kind of working alongside me. Um, that is a ground rule. Now, when I took the first speaking class, it was in high school, and I had an old fogey at that time who was a, a teacher of public speaking, and he always insisted that you start a speech with some sort of a quotation. Well, I thought that was kind of ridiculous. I've never really used that during most of my years of public speaking. But since I'm now an old fogey, I think I can probably make an exception. So I'm not going to give you one quote, but I'm going to give you three. And I think maybe, hopefully, you'll see where I'm heading. The first one comes from um, Lewis Carroll, Alice Through the Looking Glass. The time has come, the walrus said, to speak of many things of sailing ships and sails and sailing wax and cabbages and kings. Now, what has that got to do with anything? Well, I'm going to turn to John Muir, who is the father of Sierra Club. And John was one of those guys that left the women back home to kind of run the farm and while well, he wandered through the Sierras and elsewhere. But he was a, a keen observer of nature. And one of his writings has always come back to me. If you pick at something long enough, you'll find it's hitched to everything else in the universe. And I've become an ecologist, and I have found that so true ever since then. And even more recently, I've tried to come to understand quantum physics, and what I'm understanding there makes old John more correct than he ever realized. I'd like to kind of go th the third time to... Uh, a compatriot of Aldo Leopold, and I trust all of you folks have heard of him. He's by, so called by some as the, the father of wildlife science. Now, this fellow was Ernie Swift. He was the, uh, eventually became the commissioner of the Wisconsin Conservation Department back when uh, all Leopold was on the university staff there. And the one thing that he has said in his, his one book that really is fascinating me. He said, conservation is never going to go any place in this country until all of the people get behind it. And I think you'll find in a few minutes why I found that has so be so true. And finally, I'm going to go to Camille Consant. And he wrote a tome poem called The Carnival of the Animals. And there's one section in there about the fossils. Now, these are words written by Noel Coward, and I kind of like them. Amid the mastodonic fossil, I caught the eye of one small fossil. Cheer up, sad world, he said and winked. It's kind of fun to be extinct. <laughs> we laugh, but uh, seriously. We are facing more problems ecologically than I think most of society in this country is willing to face. So this is why I'm going to be talking the hard facts tonight. 
I'm going to start off with uh, the obvious, uh, the warming of the oceans and the changing of our weather patterns and the changing of our rainfall patterns. And as it's standing right now, uh, one of the, the visuals that I did have on another set shows the, the growth of the human population over the past 1,500 years, and it's an eye-opener. Every time there's a yellow dot, it represents another million people. And by the time we get to the present, there are very few places, and you can probably name the Arctic, the Antarctic, and whatnot, but most all of the globe is now super dense in human beings. And you have to wonder where are they going to get their, their resources, their water, their food. But the actual fact is that they aren't. In many of the underdeveloped countries, the United Nations tells us that there's an average of three babies dying per hour for the lack of water or clean water. The problems that we're having in Flint, Michigan right now pales by what have some of these people have to put up with. And the other thing that uh, I would bring home to you is a recent geographic, a National Geographic issue that showed the um, expected human growth without any uh, breaks on it. Something like 10 billion people uh, during this century. And if you take a look at that, you can probably picture in your own mind, it's, may, it's Asia, the places that you would think you're going to have super dense people, is what this basically shows. But this is a, if I can point to it here on the right hand side, is something that came out from NOAA just within the last few days. This is a compilation of satellite data that shows what NOAA is now calling the vegetation index or recovery index. Where you see green is where there is going to probably be some vegetation holding in there with what is expected to be normal. It's not going to change that fast. It will change, but not that fast. Where you see red is where it's be gone beyond the index of vegetation being able to support the ecosystem. And where you see red is where we also have some of the densest human populations. And one area I would point to is India. India right now as a developed nation is having terrible problems with their water. There is not enough quantity and their quality is very, very poor. Again, it makes Flint, Michigan look like it's okay. We're in the, the yellow and the orange. We have a little bit of time, according to this. What is probably going to be the biggest problem here, we're already starting to see western forests disappear. They're, they're drying up, they're burning. The Forest Service and the Canadian Forest Service is trying to figure out what is going to be the forest of the future if it will, in fact, sustain forest growth. But the biggest problems that we're going to have in this country is in the agricultural sectors. The lack of water for adequate crop production. And yet we're facing a tremendous boom in human populations. If we hope to feed the nations, which I think is going to be rather impossible for us to do it alone, we're going to need water. Last year, in May, I visited an old friend out in Sacramento. We took a few days to go down through the uh, Central Valley. It's a desertification, where in years past I've seen olive groves and I've seen uh, fields of truck crops or lettuce and what have you. There was nothing. And in fact, some places there's subsidence because they have pumped so much groundwater out that the hydrologists of California is now saying it's going to be the better part of the century before that groundwater is replenished, if ever. When I was out there, there was a small article on page two of the San Francisco paper that said that Barbara Boxer, the senator, was pulling together a committee to re-examine some of the old plans 
of where they might be able to divert water from some other river basin. One of the prime candidates is the upper Missouri. Now, I have had people say to me, that's impossible. If they can do it, it's going to cost a bundle. And my answer is, if they can pump tar sands oil down from Canada, down to the Gulf of Part of Mexico, down to the ports in, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, don't tell me they can't do it. They've already got a petition up, I've read it in the LA Times here recently, to divert the money that's been set aside for the high-speed rail from LA up to San Francisco and use those $68 million I think they have so far, which is a peanuts compared to what the, the high-speed rail is going to cost, but to put that towards finding new sources of water. Most of the greenery that we're getting in the grocery store right now, I know is coming from the Salton Sea area of California because I've been there recently. And that is being produced by Colorado River water. When they built Hoover Dam, back then it was called Boulder Dam, the state of California and Nevada actually had a water war over who was going to have supremacy of the water rights. It finally went to the United States Supreme Court, and it was the longest, most expensive court case that the court has ever had. It took them seven years before they finally adjudicated that. Now the Colorado River is over-appropriated, and they're starting to look for resources to replenish the Colorado, so that they can replenish the aquifers, and uh, not the aquifers, but the aqueducts, and the other means of transporting water to where they need it for agriculture. So that is a question mark there. One of the places they're potentially looking at, the upper Missouri River. Here not too long ago, I read about a proposal to build uh, some sort of an aqueduct from the Missouri River down along the front range of the color of the other Rockies so that they could start replenishing the Great Plains where the Algala aquifer is uh, over-appropriated. They can't draw the water from the uh, aquifer. It's been reduced that much. So the idea is to take uh, Missouri River water, truck it down, and then distribute, I guess by gravity or pump, out into uh, the Great Plains where they used to have the, the center pivot so they could start growing crops again. When I was still with the department, uh, we got involved with uh, some legislators in the, in the Department of Natural Resources to take a hard look at a very active proposal to divert Missouri River water to the uh, Red River of the North for transporting it up into Canada. That never happened, but it's still out there on the books. And here now, most recently, I read in our hometown newspaper that some yahoo in our state legislature said, well, we have so much water in Missouri, why don't we truck that down uh, to New Mexico, and uh, maybe we can make a few bucks out of it. That's the key right there, folks. Uh, I think someplace I've been quoted to say that uh, within my lifetime, water may be more expensive than gasoline. And recently, I've started, since I started this speaking, I've been taking a look Coming out here today, the cheapest gasoline I saw was $1.43. In checking in the local Walmart where I stopped yesterday, uh, water per the gallon was selling everywhere from 88 cents to $1.08. I don't know what the difference was, but uh, that's getting pretty close to parity. I'm, I'm not suggesting it's going to stay that way because I, I have a suspicion they're going to close down their refineries for some sort of maintenance or something and just cut down the supply of gasoline so they can up the price again. But that remains to be seen. But the point of it is that many of the areas that require water, at California alone, I read that they lost $7 billion worth of produce in the Central Valley alone last year. Now that's big money. So I'm beginning to see the, the hand writing on the wall. The other thing that's kind of caught my attention is it's not that long ago, the state of New Jersey signed away the water rights. Signed away the public water rights. Now, there's some legal 
implications in there that maybe makes you think, well, maybe that's not too bad. But uh, there's other states that are now looking at a different type of purchase of water rights because there are some politicians that are seeing that this may be one tremendous investment down the road. That brings me back again to a, a series of uh, one-day courses that I used to give when I was still working to stream teams. And that was basically a, a short course in basic law as it relates to water rights in this state. Water rights are very tenuous in this state. By ordinance to the union, our waterways are free. They're open for public use. It basically says that even though most of our water rights in this state are riparian rights, that means that anybody has a stream running over their personal land still has a public resource. Now, a lot of agricultural people don't believe that, but that is basically the law, whether you want to believe it or not. However, that is doctrine. It's old doctrine. And by that I mean it was court-made law back soon after the state was entered, entered the Union. And it's never really been challenged. All it takes is an act of the legislature to write a statute to blow those old doctrine laws away. A doctrine law is nothing more than case law that has been repeated with the same finding over time that eventually lawyers call it doctrine. And it means basically stare decisis, or it's been decided. But the legislature can over, override that very easily if they have a governor that's going to sign it. And that would be the first step towards basically taking any sort of public interest away. Whether that is constitutional within the United States constitutional is open for debate because there's nothing within our, our national constitution that really talks to that. We have a Bill of Rights in the uh, national constitution, but it doesn't get into that. The only thing that I see that might be a protection for the interests of this public, whether you enjoy your streams or recreation, or whether you're a farmer and you require that, that water either from your groundwater or from the stream for irrigation, is the state constitution. Now I want to take a few minutes here just to read to you the first three sections of the Missouri Department, uh, the Missouri <laughs> Constitution, um, which was written by some of the people that actually served under uh, Abe Lincoln. And these people really had an object lesson in from the Civil War in terms of the, the people's rights. And so it's rather unique. This is one of the few state constitutions that has Article I, Bill of Rights. Now let me read this to you. Section 1, Article 1, Section 1. Source of political power, origin, basis, and aim of government. Listen closely. All political power is vested and derived from the people. That's you and me. That all government of right originates from the people, is founded upon their will only, and is instituted solely for the good of the whole. Powerful words. What I've tried to give you so far is a picture of the likelihood and I think I'm getting close to saying even the probability of water becoming a very valuable and rare resource for all potential uses. So I'm turning now to law and saying what it basically are our grounds for finding some sort of resolution to what this, may pr this problem may hold. Let me go on to section two of the Bill of Rights. Promotion of the general welfare. Natural rights of people, natural rights of persons, equality under the law, the purpose of government. That all constitutional government is intended to promote the general welfare of the people. That all persons have a natural, a natural 
right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and the enjoyment of their gains of their own industry, that all persons are created equal and are entitled to equal rights and opportunity under the law, that to, all, to, that to give security to these things is the principal office of government, and that when government does not confer this security, it fails in its chief design. In section three, powers of the people over internal affairs, constitution, and form of government. That the people of this state have the inherent, sole, and exclusive right to regulate the internal government and police thereof. Now, they're not talking about police departments, but the police powers, basically, to, to uh, govern or control um, civics. And to alter and abolish their constitutional, uh, and to alter and abolish their constitutional and form of government whenever they may deem it necessary to their safety and happiness, and happiness provided such change be not repugnant to the Constitution of the United States. Of course, uh, the Constitution of the United States has supremacy over any state law. But those three articles right there is what I came back to when I started wondering what in the world can we, citizens of this state, do to protect our water down the road. I have uh, brought up a conceptual draft of a, an amendment to the Constitution of the state of Missouri under the Bill of Rights. Now, for any of you that have ever worked in a petition drive, you know that it's a lot of work. If you're looking to amend the statutes or to write a statute, as is our prerogative as citizens, then you know you have to get a lot of signatures. If you're going to modify the Constitution, you have to get almost twice the number of signatures. So if we, as a people, elect to go the route that I'm envisioning, it's going to take an awful lot of boots on the ground. This is why I have decided to start this year during a general election, looking down the road to maybe the next general election, which is 2020, because this is only the third group that I've talked to. I'm trying to get people to think. They don't have to necessarily accept what I'm offering but to start thinking about the problem and the resolution. We have to adopt, we have to take possession of the problem and realize that it's going to affect us, our children, and our civilization. But then we have to think about what sort of remedies we're going to have. So this is just one man's idea. And what I'm trying to do in these, these sections, and I'm going to have to just... Uh, defer you to the internet so you can read this. But basically, let's define water. Water in our law is water. What is it? Well, water is water. Everyone knows that. Okay. Well, we have surface water and we have groundwater. Well, yeah. But, you know, they have equality under the law. One's more important than the other, perhaps. Depends on who you are and how you're using it. But how about the water in the atmosphere? The reason I'm bringing this into a, a definition of water for the state is that most of the pollutants that we're concerned about comes to us attached to water droplets in the atmosphere. So this is a roundabout way to make sure that the quality of our water is upheld. In the next section, I get into the quality and the quantity. Because if you're a limnologist, if you're a biologist that is studying the life within a stream, for many, particularly fishes, their whole life cycle depends on the ebb and flow of rivers. They have evolved within this in terms of the volume of flow, the time of flow, the temperature of the flow, all of these parameters are important for fish like walleye, for example, 
to turn them on to do their spawning thing. Well, what's going to happen down the road is that the temperature is going to change. And in fact, right now, I have a suspicion that if I were to talk to the research people in the Department of Conservation, they would say, yeah, you're right, that our cold water resources are being affected by the changes in temperature that we're having. I would bet good money that that is happening, just based on my knowledge as an ecologist. But there's other parameters as well. We have to depend on certain water at a certain time for irrigation purposes. If, if we're having a drought and the stream is lower than the intake tube, you're not going to be able to irrigate your crops. So one of the other considerations, if you're not trying to negotiate for water rights, let's say on the Missouri River Basin, is water uh, ebb and flow, the water regime. So I bring into that, as well as the quality, that uh, puts it then into the public trust. Now, you've probably heard the, the term public trust used quite a few times. Well, he voted against what the people voted for, so he violated the public trust. That is basically an observation or a sympathy, a, a, a way you're thinking about the situation. But there is a public trust that is actually law. The law was actually established by the Caesars in early Rome. The people of Rome back then liked to eat fish. But when the Caesars started building a lot of military fortifications on some of their rivers, they were disrupting the flow. And when they disrupted the flow of the river into the, river, into the sea, they were disrupting the fish runs. Fishermen were having problems providing the fish. So they brought to the, the um, Presidium this concern, and they issued a law called the Public Trust. Basically, it says the government has the responsibility of managing water for the rights and the interests of the people. That basically, you simply said, came to the English through Roman law. And when the colonies became an independent nation, why, we copied a lot of British law. So the public trust, if you look it up on the internet, is actually a very old doctrine of law that has been upheld many times by the early Romans, been upheld many times by the British, and there is a long succession of upholding the public trust in this country. But in Missouri, it's only kind of mentioned in the ordinance of uh, acceptance to the, the nation. The, the public trust has been used only once in court law that I know of, and that was the thing that gives us the, the right to use rivers for recreational purposes, and that was Elder versus Delcor, 1956. But that was a, kind of a set up deal, quite frankly, if you read the history on that. Uh, Elder and, and Delcor uh, were fishermen. They loved to smallmouth fish on the upper Merrimack. But they had been turned away for, by a few times by some of the landowners when they pulled up to uh, relieve themselves or make a campfire to eat some beans for lunch or something like that. And they decided, this isn't right. We have rights here too, even though it's his land but this is within the high water mark. This is part of the river. So they also had good ties with the lawyers and the Supreme Court. So one of the gentlemen owned some land. The other gentleman pulled his canoe up, started a fire, laid out a sleeping bag, put up a tent as if to stay the night. And the, the first gentleman came down, ordered him his off his land, and then out of that came a test case, which made its way pretty rapidly up to the Missouri Supreme Court back in 1956. And again, if you read the history of the thing, it's rather amazing. The, the Supreme Court of the state of Missouri dug down into ancient history and pulled up the public trust, and they ruled that the floater had these rights to pull up their craft for repair, to take nourishment, and to take rest. So 
If we can do that, maybe we can do law, more if you read these first three sections of Article 1, our Bill of Rights. So what I'm doing uh, to continue on in this conceptual draft that I can't read because I left my iPad in the car, but we, we basically institute the public trust within the Constitution. That's the highest law of the land in the state. Then, for kicks, and I have yet to get any sort of uh, nod, yes or no, from lawyers on this last point, but I figured, by golly, when I joined the Department of Conservation, their lawyer took me aside and said, now son, I don't know if you've had any experience in law, but you're going to have to deal with it quite a bit. So he, he took me under his wing and he taught me a fair amount about law, as much as I could handle. And basically, what, what he said is, now you've got to understand the Department of Conservation is a public trust entity. We were created by a plebiscite, by the vote of the people. That places us square dab right in the public trust. So you're going to have to work with people. You're going to have to learn to understand people. You're not going to have to be a yes man, but you're going to have to learn to at least reason in a positive vein with the citizens of this state. Because they put us together as an institution we piss enough of them off, excuse me. <laughs> we make enough of them mad, they can undo us with one vote. So I have lived by that. But I have seen so many elected officials, so many appointed officials, so many salaried officials in my 30 some odd years working for the state that have looked the other way and voted against your interests and mine. So the last section I have in this proposed draft that I have out there on the web is that any elected, appointed, or salaried official that abrogates this trust shall be subject to dismissal. A uh, citizen suit. Now, a citizen suit is actually uh, ensconced within the Clean Water Act of the federal, it was a first. It, it gives citizens the power to sue on their own behalf, on their own standing, against any situation where they feel that their rights have been wrong or abrogated. There's no such provision in state law. So I basically write in at the end of this conceptual draft, that any official who has denied that trust, violated that trust, can be sued by the citizens and that suit is heard by the Supreme Court of the state. Now that has a legal question that uh, I will defend because of what I read you in, in sections one, two, and three of article one of the constitution. It's my belief in my reading and rereading of that that we have that right. That by golly, if you have reduced the quality of my water and, and my use of that water is going to be denied because of your actions, I want you out of here. And I'm going to sue you and I'm going to bring it to the Supreme Court. Now, of course, there comes a price with a, a civic suit. There haven't been any in this state. It's been really little used in other states under the Clean Water Act because very few people don't know it exists or that they have that power. So it's something, a tool that may have a cost with it, but it depends on the, the amount of loss that you have. It's something you're going to have to prove as a citizen. But you have the right, you have the standing to bring that suit if uh, my vision of an uh, amend amendment to the Constitution is upheld. So this is all I want to bring to you. Um, I'm going to keep it a little bit short this evening. I've, I've cut out some hee-haws and some other things that we could have gone into in more detail. But I'm kind of concerned about this whether or not it's uh, kind of like St. Charles. St. Charles, when I was in there uh, a week or two ago, uh, was pelting down uh, sleet and freezing rain and 
I was concerned about everybody getting home safely. So at that, I'm going to just basically give my case to you. The reason why I'm, I'm doing this and what I see as a resolution to the problems I see down the road, and I'm going to open it for questions.